After one of these sorrowful, shameful days, the girl, walking by Leo's side through the fields, saw the full moon coming up over the trees, and she clutched Leo's arm, crying, The time has come now. Oh, Leo, forgive me. What is it? said Leo. He was thinking of the other singers. My husband, she answered, and she laid his hand upon her breast, and the breast that he knew so well was hard as stone. Leo groaned, remembering what the crab had said. Surely we were gods once, he cried. Surely we are gods still, said the girl. Do you not remember when you and I went to the house of the crab and were not very much afraid? And since then, we have forgotten what we were singing for. We sang for the pence, and oh, we fought for them, we who are the children of the zodiac. It was my fault, said Leo. How can there be any fault of yours that is not mine, too? said the girl. My time has come, but you will live longer, and. The look in her eyes said all she could not say. Yes, I will remember that we are gods, said Leo. It is very hard, even for a child of the zodiac who has forgotten his godhead, to see his wife dying slowly, and to know that he cannot help her. The girl told Leo in those last months of all that she had said and done among the wives and the babies at the back of the roadside performances, and Leo was astonished that he knew so little of her who had been so much to him. When she was dying, she told him never to fight for pence or quarrel with the other singers, and, above all, to go on with his singing immediately after she was dead. Then she died, and after he had buried her, he went down the road to a village that he knew, and the people hoped that he would begin quarreling with a new singer that had sprung up while he had been away. But Leo called him my brother. The new singer was newly married, and Leo knew it. And when he had finished singing, Leo straightened himself and sang the song of the girl, which he had made coming down the road. Every man who was married or hoped to be married, whatever his rank or color, understood that song. Even the bride, leaning on the new husband's arm, understood it too. And presently, when the song ended, and Leo's heart was bursting in him, the men sobbed. That was a sad tale, they said at last. Now make us laugh. Because Leo had known all the sorrow that a man could know, including the full knowledge of his own fall who had once been a god, he, changing his song quickly, made the people laugh till they could laugh no more. They went away feeling ready for any trouble in reason, and they gave Leo more peacock feathers and pence than he could count. Knowing that pence led to quarrels, and that peacock feathers were hateful to the girl, he put them aside and went away to look for his brothers, to remind them that they too were gods. He found the bull goring the undergrowth in a ditch, for the scorpion had stung him, and he was dying, not slowly as the girl had died, but quickly. I know all, the bull groaned as Leo came up. I had forgotten too, but I remember now. Go and look at the fields I ploughed. The furrows are straight. I forgot that I was a god, but I drew the plough perfectly straight for all that. And you, brother? I am not at the end of the ploughing, said Leo. Does death hurt? No, but dying does, said the bull, and he died. The cultivator who then owned him was much annoyed, for there was a field still unploughed. It was after this that Leo made the song of the bull, who had been a god and forgotten the fact, 
and he sang it in such a manner that half the young men in the world conceived that they too might be gods without knowing it. A half of that half grew impossibly conceited and died early. A half of the remainder strove to be gods and failed. But the other half accomplished four times more work than they would have done under any other delusion. Later, years later, always wandering up and down and making the children of men laugh, he found the twins sitting on the bank of a stream, waiting for the fishes to come and carry them away. They were not in the least afraid, and they told Leo that the woman of the house had a real baby of her own, and that when that baby grew old enough to be mischievous, he would find a well-educated cat waiting to have its tail pulled. Then the fishes came for them, but all that the people saw was two children drowned in a brook. And though their foster-mother was very sorry, she hugged her own real baby to her breast, and was grateful that it was only the foundlings. Then Leo made the song of the twins, who had forgotten that they were gods, and had played in the dust to amuse a foster-mother. That song was sung far and wide among the women. It caused them to laugh and cry and hug their babies closer to their hearts all in one breath. And some of the women who remembered the girl said, "'Surely that is the voice of Virgo. Only she could know so much about ourselves.'" After those three songs were made, Leo sang them over and over again, till he was in danger of looking upon them as so many mere words, and the people who listened grew tired, and there came back to Leo the old temptation to stop singing once and for all. But he remembered the girl's dying words, and persisted. One of his listeners interrupted him as he was singing, Leo, said he, I have heard you telling us not to be afraid for the past forty years. Can you not sing something new now? No, said Leo, it is the only song that I am allowed to sing. You must not be afraid of the houses, even when they kill you. The man turned to go wearily, but there came a whistling through the air, and the arrow of the archer was seen skimming low above the earth, pointing to the man's heart. He drew himself up, and stood still, waiting till the arrow struck home. "'I die,' he said quietly. "'It is well for me, Leo, that you sang for forty years.' "'Are you afraid?' said Leo, bending over him. "'I am a man, not a god,' said the man. "'I should have run away but for your songs.' My work is done, and I die without making a show of my fear. I am very well paid, said Leo to himself. Now that I see what my songs are doing, I will sing better ones. He went down the road, collected his little knot of listeners, and began the song of the girl. In the middle of his singing, he felt the cold touch of the crab's claw on the apple of his throat. He lifted his hand, choked, and stopped for an instant. "'Sing on, Leo,' said the crowd. "'The old song runs as well as ever it did.' Leo went on steadily till the end, with the cold fear at his heart. When his song was ended, he felt the grip on his throat tighten. He was old. He had lost the girl. He knew that he was losing more than half his power to sing. He could scarcely walk to the diminishing crowds that waited for him, and could not see their faces when they stood about him. Nonetheless, he cried angrily to the crab, "'Why have you come for me now?' "'You were born under my care. How can I help coming for you?' said the crab wearily. Every human being whom the crab killed had asked that same question. "'But I was just beginning to know what my songs were doing,' said Leo. "'Perhaps that is why,' said the crab, and the grip tightened. 
"'You said you would not come till I had taken the world by the shoulders,' gasped Leo, falling back. Let me live to see the world know it, pleaded Leo. Let me be sure that my songs make men brave, said the crab. Even then there would be one man who was afraid. The girl was braver than you are. Come. Leo was standing close to the restless, insatiable mouth. I forgot, he said simply. The girl was braver, but I am a god too, and I am not afraid. What is that to me? said the crab. Then Leo's speech was taken from him, and he lay still and dumb, watching death till he died. Leo was the last of the children of the zodiac. After his death, there sprang up a breed of little mean men, whimpering and flinching and howling, because the houses killed them and theirs, who wished to live forever without any pain. They did not increase their lives, but they increased their own torments miserably, and there were no children of the Zodiac to guide them, and the greater part of Leo's songs were lost. Only he had carved on the girl's tombstone the last verse of the Song of the Girl, which stands at the head of this story. One of the children of men, coming thousands of years later, rubbed away the lichen, read the lines, and applied them to a trouble other than the one Leo meant. Being a man, men believed that he had made the verses himself. But they belong to Leo, the child of the Zodiac, and teach, as he taught, that whatever comes or does not come, we men must not be afraid. End of The Children of the Zodiac